Hello and welcome to another episode of Clone Wars Conversations. I'm your host, James Arnold Taylor. Enemies, a classic storytelling device. Two conflicting beliefs or points of view clashing in an angry and most always violent form. But few stories have as much bitterness and rage behind them as the tale of the Jedi and the Sith. And in our story today, especially Master Obi-Wan Kenobi and one of evil's most vile apprentices, Darth Maul. Maul was first brought to life on the big screen in Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace, and from the moment we first saw him, we couldn't look away. He's a perfect reflection of sinister malevolence, yet we're drawn to him, desiring to know more, look deeper. But as quickly as he came upon the scene, he's gone by making one fatal move. He kills the master this Jedi so desperately cared for and needed. And in turn, his fate is sealed. Or is it? The return of Darth Maul could have only happened in Clone Wars, in my opinion, and thanks to the brilliant mind of George Lucas, the unbound supervision of Dave Filoni, and the technical geniuses at Lucas Animation, even a Sith who was only half the man he was after meeting a certain Jedi Knight, got a new lease on life and some new legs for walking. Brothers originally aired March 9, 2012 in the fourth season of Clone Wars, and it did what seemed to happen time and again on the show. It allowed us deeper access to the truths at the heart of the Star Wars universe and the meaning behind light and dark. It made us love this demon all the more and crave the next episode that might bring him back again. Maul on Clone Wars allowed us more of this character we just couldn't get enough of and brought the true pain and misfortune of his story to life in a way we could have never imagined before. And to me, the key element of this rebirth came from the power of his voice and the pathos brought to it by the actor that played him. However, today's guest has actually portrayed more than just this dark, tortured soul. He's in fact been some of the most powerful and dangerous force-wielding characters ever. From the son of the Force in season three's Mortis arc to the Emperor himself, to even the secret apprentice of Lord Vader who ended up being a real star killer. Join me now for part one of my talk with a walking Wikipedia who is strong in the false indeed, Sam Whitworth. Welcome to The Conversation. So, uh, Sam, I'm guessing uh, before you were all these various, very powerful characters in the force, you were a Han Solo man. Am I guessing if we go way back? In terms of who my favorite character yeah, would be. Yeah, like when, when you were growing up, was were you, were you more light side Han Solo or were you still going, boy, that Vader, he's got something I like. I'm, I'm going to blow your mind uh -oh. in terms of who my favorite Star Wars character is. It's, okay. Uh, Luke Skywalker. Well, no, that, <laughs> I, I can appreciate that because how could you not? Well, it's, he's the most, to me, he's easily the most interesting character yeah. because the, the, the arc starting as kind of a, a nerdy farm boy yeah. and growing up through the movies and becoming an adult yeah. um, and being effective and saving everyone in a way that no one else could have predicted. I mean, come on, that, that guy, he's the guy. He's, he's, <laughs> we should all be so lucky as to, uh, to be like Luke Skywalker. I'll tell you, it is the one thing, um, obviously, you know, Mark and, and we've been fortunate enough to get to uh, work with him and talk with him and such. Arguably the most famous movie hero of all time, and yet it's really only until now that I think people are really feeling the weight of what, what apparently Sam Whitler has known all along. Oh, this God. is the great. You know what I mean? It's like it's so wonderful to finally see people kind of giving well, Luke his justice. Yeah, let's let's talk about that for a second. <laughs> okay, for, and then we'll get to the wars. But yeah, because you have Harrison Ford, who is easily one of the coolest. Yeah movie actors Absolutely. of all time. He's, sure. he's, you know, up there with Jimmy Stewart and yep. Humphrey Bogart and all these guys. So you have this tremendous charismatic performance that serves a very particular function. And that's, <laughs> and, and, and it's a very specific function that you need in Star Wars. You need right. that. You need the, the voice of, I don't get all these space wizards and robots. I don't understand <laughs> any of this. And this doesn't make any sense. And yeah. I'm just in it. I just want to get along and have a practical I want to make a living. Yeah. But what people I think are finally starting to understand, as you pointed out, is that you don't have Star Wars without Mark Hamill's specific performance. Yeah. That um, I think some of the reasons some people 
maybe are like, oh, Luke, he's such a whiner and stuff yeah. like that, is that it's like, I think, I think on some subconscious level, Luke does such a good job of being us. The everyman, yeah, absolutely. That people are uncomfortable with that. They go, absolutely. whoa, man, I want, and it's like, Han Solo is the cool guy. I'd be like, no, I think you're uncomfortable with Luke because we all, none of us started as the cool guy. <laughs> yeah. None of us, and, and, and if we're lucky, we have, by the end of, or you know, by the end of our life, carved out some sort of niche for ourselves. But Luke is the representation of that journey. And, yeah, great point. And the fact that, I saw an interview with Mark Hamill in like the 80s, and it made it very clear that that was a very deliberate choice on his part to play yeah. him as kind of a little bit too high energy in the first one and yeah. out, uh, callow and out of his depth. And then the second one, a troubled young man right. who, was, who also was becoming proficient but also making a lot of mistakes right. to the very centered adult that he becomes a Return of the Jedi. Yeah. Now that, without that, there is no Star Wars. That's, uh, amen, brother. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. So and, everyone gives Harrison Ford the credit. Right. Um, and he deserves a lot of credit. He does. It's great. But he, his character is there to flesh out Luke. You well know? Well said. Well that's, said. That's, and, well, and Harrison Ford, I think, would tell you something Yeah, I think he would similar. agree with that. I've seen interviews yeah. where he says yeah. stuff like that. And, uh, now, if you want to talk about Indiana Jones... Oh, let me see. My favorite character in Indiana Jones is Indiana Jones. You see, know, so. I don't know if you know this. My all-time favorite film and my entire childhood was Raiders of Lost was Ark. It, is it right? So when I was a kid, uh, my best friend, Steph, would leave for the summer to go to his dad's house up north because his parents were divorced. And every summer they played Raiders of the Lost Ark at the Magic Lantern Theater in Isla Vista, where I'm from in Santa Barbara, over where UCSB is. And I would see it for two bucks and I would stay in there all day. The manager let me stay in and I would and you stay just in watch it over and over, over and over. So I've seen that movie literally hundreds of times. You know, it's just, I love it. I grew up as, as did you when, when VCRs first yeah. came on the scene, right? Yeah. Do you remember those big and they were oh, wood gosh, panels yeah. and you hit the button and it go, <laughs> <laughs> it would just make that sound. So Raiders of the Lost Ark, we had a bootlegged copy of it. Yeah. So I too had the same experience of watching it over and over again. Yeah. Um, and and I to the point where I'd memorized the movie and then I'd gone away from it for like I want to say like almost 10 years and I was yeah. in college right yes and I there was a video store so I, I was like I just lost Ark. my friends are talking about this I'm gonna rent this I haven't I I know I can recite sure. the movie but I haven't seen it right in like 10 years yeah and when I watched it I was like I don't believe how this is it. actually the greatest movie to ever. I mean, <laughs> it's right? incredible. It's because he, I mean, it was wonderful to see what Spielberg and Lucas could do together, mm -hmm. and what George had learned from what he'd done already. In Star Wars, yeah. but it's 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 really one of the most near perfect movies in my opinion. That's so good. It hits every mark, <laughs> and it was so the first good. movie to really have that action-packed beginning that mm -hmm. doesn't really have anything to do with anything else until, well, except for. Bella can, you know, we got Sure, a, but know. still, it's like a, the non sequitur. Uh, same with some of the Star Wars movies. The, yeah. The job of the Hut thing is its own adventure. It doesn't yeah. really have to do with the Darth Vader story. Oh, man. But what's, what's I feel like Raiders, the, 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 the Indiana Jones movies and the Star yeah. Wars movies, these would be the equivalent of the Saturday morning serials that will be alternating, you yeah, know, that's every exactly, Saturday. That's what I wish everybody would kind of realize with Star Wars and where it's become, because Everybody's so intense about Star Wars now. Yeah, yeah. These were made for fun. Mm -hmm. They were made to tell these adventures that are greater and bigger than us and make us feel something different than what we feel. And so that, you know, I, I, we're taking them so literal sometimes. They're so serious. And it's right. like, you gotta remember this. this it's, for, it's fun. Yeah, it's entertaining. Um, have you seen, I, I suspect maybe you have, huh? the, the Buster Crab Saturday morning serials. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Gosh. I grew up watching these things, yeah. Did you? Yeah, yeah. See, I sought them out because I knew that they were the inspiration for Star Wars. So much of this, yeah. And, oh my God, they're entertaining. Yeah. But and you could see that, like even the pacing. You, the, I was gonna see. say, the acting beats and the, the, the dynamic of what they were doing. Right. And that's why, you know, people go, well, George is a very kind of hands-off director or what have you. Or, he has a certain style. It's like, yeah, it's based off of those things. Buster Crab, Flash Gordon, yeah. and, and Buck Rogers, but yeah. I think mostly Flash Gordon. Flash Gordon. Just when, when, when the prequels first came out, I was one of the people who just thought the, the design was perfect because 
everyone else they were they were looking for well it doesn't look like star wars yeah. they wanted these junky ships that were all chipped up and it's broken a different time period it's not supposed to not yet yeah, yeah. exactly the, and i and i when i you start seeing these rocket ships that look like flash gordon from, yeah from the flash Absolutely. gordon serial and i go silver like, oh my god they're going for it like yeah so bust it was the buster crab era and then it deteriorated as the empire came and then became star wars yeah. So I just thought that was so brave of them when you see, you know, these Great sleek point. rocket ship looking yeah, spaceships. That's... And and then for that to slowly deteriorate, <laughs> I just thought that was wonderful. But, you know, the, the benefit of it is here, let's see how well I do this segue, is <laughs> what it then brought to Dave Filoni and the crew creating Clone Wars. Oh, God. Because it really became a, a mishmash of both mm -hmm. and new yeah. Uh, new ways of doing things. So Clone Wars um, obviously affected my life uh, very, very strong, but you were involved with it before Darth Maul. We, we started with the sun. Yeah. How was, how was that part brought to you? How did that all come about <laughs> for you? Isaac? That, I got, a, I got a call from Lucasfilm. Because um, my, my history with Clone Wars was probably not unlike a lot of, Star Wars fans. Okay. Um, like you said, Star Wars has such a, you know, the, the spirit of it is such fun, right? So yeah. I would put on Clone Wars. Okay. And I'd watch it and I'd go, it's, it's a good looking show. I'm glad they're making this. It's not quite for me. It's for a younger right. audience, but hey, good for you guys. Good for you. Good, good. <laughs> um, I didn't disparage it, but I didn't love it. And somewhere around season two, yeah. Yeah. there were things that were happening. I'm like, oh, the show's gotten a little older. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, oh. And they were started to just hint at things that were really just firing my yes. adult imagination. Yes, absolutely. And, um, and so I started becoming a fan of the show. Oh, so great. I became a fan of the show before I got the call. And so when I, got, I get this call from, from uh, my agent saying they, they want you to be in the Clone Wars. And it yeah. was because of Star Wars The Force Unleashed. Which, right, I, yeah, which we'll get, we'll, we're gonna, right, totally we're gonna get to that. that, but yeah. So, so and, I, and I thought I understood what, what that was about because they were hiring me and Adrian Wilkinson who yeah. played Maris Brood in The Force Unleashed. Right. And when Clone Wars first came out, Star Wars Force Unleashed also came out and we were, as I saw it, servicing two different groups of fans. Clone Wars was servicing the younger ones. Yeah. Uh, Force Unleashed was servicing the older fans. Yeah. Now, by the time you get to season three, <laughs> Clone Wars is now starting to serve as the older fans. You know what exactly. I mean? Like some of the stuff that was happening was very sophisticated. It was. And, uh, and so I, I thought at the time, I was like, I think, I think they're, by getting me and Adrian into Clone Wars, they're, they're trying to suggest that now Clone Wars is an older show. Yeah. And that, so that's what I thought it was the purpose. And, and I thought, okay, well, I'm playing a bounty hunter or something. And, and Lucasfilm kept saying, it's a really cool role. And yeah. I was like, all right, I'll do it. And then I get a call a week later and be like, hey, listen, this is a really cool role. And I'm like, <laughs> I already said yes. Yeah. I, you, you don't need to sell me on this. Okay. And then by the third time I heard this is a really cool role, mm -hmm. I started getting, I started feeling like, oh, maybe they mean this. And then I started getting really scared. Uh. And when I showed up on the first day, yeah. in the first Mortis episode, my character doesn't have that much to say. And yeah, Overlords is the title of that Overlords. Yeah. And the sun does not say much in that episode. And no. I was so thankful. Oh, really? Yes, because I showed up and here you are as Obi-Wan Kenobi and Matt Lanter is and Anakin. Matt and and Ashley, know, Ashley is, yeah. is Ahsoka Tano. Dee was there. Yeah. Everyone in their character, all the characters are so dialed in at this point. This yeah. is season three. You guys have been working on this for years now. And it was a pretty um, small cast for those episodes. It was, right. it was Lloyd Scher. So who was your father, yes. and then uh, Adrian um, and yourself, and then D. Tom was ISDN, mm -hmm. you know, Yoda and narrator. It was a small cast. That's right. So a lot of scrutiny on yeah. each cast oh. member. And you guys were dialed in. You oh, guys were, well, well, no, but you were. I we mean, were really walking. at a comfortable place. We were really, yeah, it gets me emotional thinking about it. We were so happy with this family that had been created. Yeah. And it was, it was a wonderful, it was a really powerful, weird, strange storyline that was presented to it us. It was very weird. And, and, and as some people either know or they don't know, yeah. when it comes to any Dave Filoni animated project, <laughs> uh, especially the Star Wars stuff, it's yeah. not like you just show up 
say some lines and leave. He yeah. will sit there and talk through the whole story and explain mythologically what this yes. is meant to represent. Here's what we're going for here. He will give a whole monologue just to even kick off the record. It's, I can't wait to, uh, you know, every, we've done about seven of these shows already. Mm -hmm. And every single guest has talked about oh God. Dave coming in and telling that. And everybody has such fond memories of it. It's like, I want to put a compilation of that together and I only send wish it to Dave and go, those... please know how much everybody appreciated oh, what you did there. But because... that's why that show feels like it has this mythological relevance because it's not like any scene yeah. that you performed or Matt performed. It's not like it was people just kind of shooting in the dark. We were always aiming for targets. Yeah, that we're, we're always spelled going out for, for us. Right. I yeah. mean, and there are other voice gigs, as you know, or or indeed on camera gigs where you show up and do you think who knows what it? it's about? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have no idea. I mean, you make a guess. You you think you know what it's about, and you try to bring that to it, but yeah, no one's going to sit there and talk for about thirty minutes and and get your imagination spinning up. Yeah, you know, in the, in the way that those... with the passion uh, that he had for it too, and what he was doing, I think that was the beauty of it, is that he always yeah. understood exactly what he was doing. He still does, obviously, but in working so close with George Lucas. I was just gonna say, see, that's that's one of the things about it's a about once in a lifetime thing. It's, Clone Wars, yeah, is that uh, it being the last George Lucas produced Star Wars. There's a significance there, and Man. and and how often did you hear the words from Dave? Um, because he would, you know, those, those monologues he would spin to, yeah. to get people up to speed on what this story was about or that story is about. He would talk about, he would give you an insight into the conversations he had with George or how George presented the story or what George feels is the most important thing to come mm -hmm. across. And how many times did you hear sometimes, uh, you'd come back for pickups. Yeah. Uh, George changed, changed the line to this, or he wants you to do it more like this, or he wants that. I mean, that's. That was always <laughs> the most exciting, unnerving, interesting. Uh, uh, everything involved that you could put into it. Uh, imagine, yeah. Uh, I remember being on a vacation once and getting a call from from Dave, <laughs> and he goes, "Hey, hey, just want I wanted you to know, I just came out of a meeting, uh, and I'm like, okay, what's going on?" And he goes, um, "George uh, called your performance from so and so an episode. He said, he said he called it gold. He called it out in front of everyone. He called it that performance is gold." And I'm like. <laughs> Okay. He's like, all right, bye. <laughs> and that was it. And he just calls me to, to say he liked it. I'm like, well, that's good. <laughs> that's great. I mean, it's better than the alternative. <laughs> yeah. He calls. I was just happy when he said, <laughs> George, George liked what you did there. <laughs> it's like, you know. Okay. The fact that he watched it was, I mean, you know. Well, but he, you know, not only, <laughs> exactly. It, you're, you're, like... That's what you're thinking. You're thinking, because when, when I first started the project, I mean, you, it was more apparent to you guys but because you, you were obviously in the middle of this, just kicking off this big project. But right. when I first started it, it wasn't totally clear to me how involved George Lucas was. Yeah. So as things like that kept happening or, or as I would visit Lucasfilm more and more, I started realizing, I'm like, oh, this is significant. This, this is. is. And, you know, Dave will tell you himself. He's like, oh, the stories come from George. Yeah. Sure. I, Dave, yeah, Dave had a hand in, it, here's it how we're going to yeah. do it, and blah, blah, blah. But the stories themselves are these George Lucas stories that, that he were... wants to get across. And, you know, Jet Lucas said something to me really fun. Yeah. Which was just, I just thought this was the, it completely confirmed everything that I thought about what was happening in Clone Wars. Jet Lucas said to me, George's kid. Yes. Who's an awesome guy, by the way. He is. I want to have him in here, actually. You should. Episode, he's, yeah. he's so cool. Uh, Jet said to me, he goes, one of the reasons why Clone Wars is brilliant is because Clone Wars is Star Wars made by a guy who's sick of Star Wars, referring to his dad. Right. And that's why it's brilliant. And that's you just go, brilliant. yeah. You just go, yeah. Because George never, ever tried to retrace his steps or, or rehash something he did. He was always pushing it out in different areas where Star Wars hadn't been yet. Yes. And that's what was so exciting about watching Clone Wars week after week is you never knew and what it was never see. the same thing. Never the same thing. It was brilliant. Yeah, that's that is brilliant of of him. That was Jet's uh, yeah. Jet Lucas's words right there. So now you were in nine episodes of Clone Wars altogether. I guess so. Yes. It felt it felt like more. You know, I mean, again, it's like because I wouldn't such leave you guys alone. 
because I kept showing up going, hey. No, it's because every time I turned around, Darth Maul was there. <laughs> Plaguing you. Um, uh, hurting someone I loved. That's right. Well, no, that too, uh, yes. Overlords, Altar of Mortis, Ghosts of Mortis. An amazing arc. And again, as we've kind of been talking about, that's really important stuff. Yeah. To This was the first time we heard from George Lucas as to what the Force where it really kind of came from in such in, in in this way, right? Sure, or the concept that the Force goes a lot deeper than just Jedi and Sith. Yeah. There's way more going on there. How was that playing this character then that has that that ability, that power that's unlike anything we've seen it's before? It was terrifying. It was really scary. Because, because as it was sold, not sold to me, you know, as, as they told me, they said... <laughs> Didn't need to sell it all. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's bought the moment they yeah. offer it. But they said to me... You're, you're playing the dark side of the Force. That's what you represent in this story. So your yeah. character is the living embodiment of the dark side. <laughs> and you, you start going, okay, well, I've played characters before, but the dark side is a theme. I've never played a theme before. Yeah. How do you play a theme? A theme. <laughs> and and, and so, so different from Starkiller, too. So very, really. Well, and okay, it's funny you should say, yeah. I was about to go into this in terms of how do you play a theme and Starkiller and how yeah. those two related. Because in that first episode, I didn't have that much to say. Right. And by the second episode, I, I remember being really worried about that. And, and actually, it was in the first episode that I said to Dave, after maybe my fifth line or something. I yeah. Because I was hearing it, and I was just hearing Starkiller's voice, which is basically my, uh, very close to my own voice. Right. And I said, Dave, are you, are we concerned that this character is going to sound too much like Starkiller? And Dave did what any bright director does when he sees that an actor is losing confidence he just he lied he goes he goes well sam if you're worried about this character sounding too much like star killer well that's okay because because star killer had a connection to the dark side of the force and this character is the dark side of the force so it's okay if he sounds like star killer and he he totally made it up right there on the spot <laughs> I don't know that he meant that. Yeah, he was but just actually to... that makes sense, though. But the moment he said that, sense. like, he sent me home. It was after that, and I go home, and I, and I just kept thinking about that. Like, if because Starkiller has a connection to the dark side, this guy can sound like Starkiller. Well, then, if that's, that's going to make sense, what Dave said to me, he should sound like all of the dark side characters that we know. Now, see, I remembered that coming into play. And that was the <laughs> next see, that in was the episode the next two. Yeah, so that was so uh, came back. Altar of Mortis. And I had time to think about that. So thank God I didn't have that Sister. much dialogue in the first. Time. And you started you, doing you all the little, yeah, you know, like yeah, he would dip into Palpatine or dip into. It was Vader so or, much fun for all of us being in the room, watching all of that, taking part in all of that, uh, because it was like, oh, now we get it. The other thing too, I'm sure. I don't know if you, I'm sure you remember this. When uh, you actually caught Padme. a pretty big story <laughs> thing that they would never have lived down had that gone out. You know what I mean? I want to believe that they would have corrected it. I want to believe they would have caught that too, yeah. But, because cause even, because <laughs> even I, I mean, I'm, I'm a Padawan when it comes to it. Uh, but I went, oh yeah, like instant. we all kind of went instantly, oh yeah, of course. So, but. Matt tell, Lanter, tell us what, what this was. Matt Lanter performs this really very emotional scene where he sees Anakin is talking to his dead mother. Yeah. And Shmi. Shmi. And he says to her, I have a wife and I want you to meet her. Yeah, you, Just, you would really like her. You would like her. And, yeah. and Matt performed it very emotionally and yeah. really very, very well. And we were about to move on, and I'm still the new guy in the room. And I raised my hand. I, remember, I can still see you. I still raised my hand. Because I here. was like, what do you do? Yeah. Like, <laughs> so I raised my hand, and Dave's like, and we're about to move on. And I said, um, got to do that again. And he goes, well, wh yeah. what's the new guy saying now? <laughs> Why? And I said, because Padme already met Shmi. Yeah, they had in dinner the Phantom Menace. They had food. <laughs> yeah. Jar Jar was broke bread, man. Yeah, exactly. And so, and and I saw Dave, kind of, take his hat. And, <laughs> yeah. And and I just remember looking over at Ashley, and Ashley goes, "I've never seen someone out geek Dave Filoni before." <laughs> and I think, yeah, that was when Dave was thinking, maybe we keep this guy around a little bit. I think <laughs> that's my theory. Well, there was quite an uproar in the room at that point, too. We were all having a good time. And then that gave us an opportunity to actually 
razz Dave about something too, you know? So that was, it was a lot of fun. Well, and that's the thing. It's not like he didn't know that. It's no, just that there's so much just, work going it's on. Juggling. That, exactly. You're juggling yeah. so many, so it's, you know, the it's moment I said it, he's dialogue. like, of course. Of course. How could right. we miss that? Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, and it's a big universe. But it's also uh, incredibly important because it's a very powerful scene. Mm -hmm. it's, a, uh, it's crucial to the whole telling of that arc mm -hmm. of what's happening with him and Shmi with Anakin seeing his mother again yeah. and all this. You can't get that wrong, man. No. It's like if I went, you are my sister, Anakin. What? It just wouldn't have made no, sense. No, it doesn't make You are my friend. What? You are my buddy. No, yeah, you are my no. brother. You, you have to get the lines right. You, you know? do. That was... There was so much pressure in those episodes to get that right. Well, and that was the other thing about those episodes is that he explained it to us. Remember he explained it, he said, all of the events of Star Wars are playing out in this world, but in yeah. different ways. In and, different and ways. And so, so if there was ever a time, because there was always an effort in Clone Wars. Yeah. I mean, in the first season, there were certain lines that were like direct references yeah. to stuff in the movies. Yep. But as Clone Wars went on and started burning its own path. Right. Season you three, guys would avoid. Yeah. Yeah. At any, you guys would avoid going to lines that had been said or going to line reads that have been said. But in this case, in Mortis, yeah, he encouraged us. He goes, if there is some line or something that will remind us of something that happens in one of the movies or in one of the episodes, yeah, do it that way. There was some other ones that you did. There were Emperor in there too, right? There yes, was, there were uh, flavors, of, which you, of course you voiced the Emperor and Palpatine as well and you have for, yeah I've, in force unleashed i did and, and then in uh in rebels, in rebels as well yeah but but yeah that was those were interesting episodes because the rules did not apply for those episodes. <laughs> no absolutely and i think that those ones are i know that like cat Tabor, for example she's like i don't know what i feel about those you know like because she's you know she's as big of a star wars fan as you are and she's right, right. yeah I, i'm pretty close up that like the two, i would love to have the two of you on uh, in a battle of wits on Perfect. Star Wars things, because she she knows her Star Wars too. But, mm -hmm. but uh, moving on to then Darth Maul, uh, you know what I love is so the episodes you were in, except for uh, two of them, you had Brothers, Revenge, Revival, Eminence. You're like Steven Seagal. You just get the <laughs> the one <laughs> name. You know, All Steven Seagal. Sam Witwer action is movie titles. Brothers. Absolutely. Revenge. Yeah. Uh, but then we went on the Shades of Reason and the Lawless. The Lawless is. Oh boy. That's a very special one to me. Oh um, boy. But brothers, uh, let's back up though. You've been the son. Obviously, you've already been involved in Star Wars for so long in so many important ways, like with Starkiller and doing like mocap and all that, which we'll yeah. get into, which hadn't been done with voice for these characters. But then you get a call to play Darth Maul. Okay, so <laughs> there was a, I believe it, it had to have been a pickup episode for for the Mortis trilogy. Yeah. Because I remember being in a Mortis trilogy um, uh, session. Okay. And Dave, brought, he, he asked me, what do you think about this idea that Darth Maul survived? <laughs> and it, it had been re it, like revealed somehow either through the press or something that had aired on Clone Wars that hinted at that. And, and so I was aware of it. Okay. So it must have been a pickup because that wouldn't have yeah, been, that early been on, no. it, we would not have known no. that far in advance. So he said, what do you think about that? And I remember being like, well, yeah, I mean, he got cut in half. What's up with that? <laughs> and then in that same conversation, he goes, you know, there might be something kind of interesting for you down the road. And I'm like, like a bounty hunter? Which is the same thing I said when <laughs> Lucasfilm yeah. originally called. They're like, you're going to be doing Clone Wars. I'm like, like a bounty hunter? <laughs> I don't know what's with me and bounty hunters. Clancy Brown was the same way, actually. Like a bounty hunter? Yeah. yeah. And then, of course, Solange. Oh, like, yeah, so... so he said, yeah, there's, there's something for you down the road. And I'm like, yeah, something like that. And he goes, yeah, something like a bounty hunter, sure. And <laughs> what I didn't understand is that was all in the same, same conversation. So he was trying to hint to me. Yeah. And when I didn't get it, he made no effort to straighten me out. So when he called me a year later, and I, I, I was totally unprepared. I'd yeah. gotten some hints from people at Lucasfilm that like, hey, there's going to be a cool, very cool call coming for you. Yeah. And I'm like, it's a very, what does that mean? <laughs> and so uh, I get this call and I was driving over to, it was a very big day for me because I was driving over to Drew Struzan's house to see him. Oh, and I wanted to talk about Drew as well. Yeah, I, I was going to watch him do some painting for a being human painting that he really? was doing for a poster. So I was already psyched. I was already having like a really good day as I'm driving over to Drew's and I get this call from Dave. Yeah. And I had to pull over to take it because I'm like, oh, I hear it's a very cool call. So let's just 
pull over. Yeah. So I'm sitting in the car and he goes, and, and he didn't mince words. He just goes, I need Darth Maul. Can you do it? And the way <laughs> he said it, it was clear. He wasn't asking, are you available? No. Are you interested? It was, if I hire you, is that going to be a mistake? Right. right. <laughs> I mean, it was like that. It was totally clear. Yeah. He was saying, I need Darth Maul. I'm making the right call Can right now. Can you do right? it? Yes. Yeah. You know, because yeah. I, I need this. Yeah. And you understand this is important. Yeah. <laughs> Be honest with me. So I did the same thing that he did in the Mortis thing. You, I, I lied. You lied. <laughs> and I said, yeah, no problem, man. Well, sure, I, I got this. Yeah. Of course I can do this. And then he talked a little bit about what he felt he needed and then said, well, we'll talk more later. I can't talk now about it, but start thinking about it like this. Gets off the phone and, and my, I just started melting. My brain was <laughs> like oozing out of my ears because I, I was like, I don't know if I can do that. That's what? Yeah. Yeah. There's what? a lot to think about and what people are going to think as far as that have loved that character or that are thinking, how is he even going to come back? There's a lot of judgment that could be put on you just it's, for even being the voice of things that have no control over you. You almost can only lose. Yeah. Almost. And Almost. yet, somehow we got away with it. <laughs> I don't know what happened. He's, you know, I mean, after all the years of, of working, you know, Ray Park and I are I very good Ray. friends and we've worked for years together and we've done shows, countless shows talking about Darth Maul and his character and live shows where you're, you're on stage and you say the name Darth Maul and the crowd goes crazy. There's this love for this character that we should hate. Which we should thank Ray for. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean um, he's been so awesome to me, by the way. Yeah. And I, I don't, I don't know if I've ever told you, but I, I just always run into that guy. Yeah. yeah Airports, restaurants, it. just like, oh, hey, Ray. Mall but meets mall. Even before I did, long oh, before really? I did mall, long before I did mall, I was like, hey, I'm, I'm doing Star Wars stuff too. He's like, oh, great. You know? <laughs> uh, and then Good later <laughs> I bump into him like, so you, probably heard he's like yes i'm like thank you <laughs> like appreciate being able to borrow your face yeah. i guess yeah um no, but the thing uh, going into that i mean the, the madness of mall when you got them and so when yeah. you got that script did you get it before going into the studio did you get a little oh, yeah. advance you had to dave it, right? and i talked about that because i was in montreal shooting being human at the time yeah. and then and then we would schedule it when I would have time to come back or various times when I have a chance to come back to LA for a second. But he, we talked about it months in advance. Okay. We had, we had it, I, as I recall, we had this one conversation on the phone that lasted well over an hour. Yeah. And it, we talked through the entire first arc of episodes that Maul would do. Wow. And that, and because we're like, we, we can't, we can't screw this up. No, you can't, yeah. We're going to blow this, and yeah. people are going to hate us for the rest of our lives, and this is... It was, it's a beautiful, I mean, it's playing in my head as we're talking, it, you know, in Savage, Clancy's part. Clancy's part was amazing. Morally, which Ben Diskin we had I, in. I, and, I, by the way, Ben Diskin, I, he, he made a real impression on me when we were doing the, the mall stuff. Cause yeah. As you know, as a voice actor, right, like, everyone, okay, let's talk about different art forms here for a second. <laughs> When it comes to anyone who admires a computer programmer, mm -hmm. they admire it and they go, man, I don't know how they do that. Right. Anyone that admires someone who can compose or play music extremely well or sing extremely well, right. people sit back and go, man, I don't know how they do that. Yeah. When it comes to any kind of acting, yeah. well, everyone can talk. <laughs> so everyone on some level, not everyone, but a lot of people think, I can kind of do that. No, I, I think everyone thinks that. <laughs> Ah, Trust thinks, me, that, everyone yeah, thinks that. I can do that, because everyone can talk. Yeah. It's just talking. Whatever, mm -hmm. man. It's talking in a certain way. Oh, and then voice I acting. do voices. Let's talk about voices. I do voices. Yeah, that's that whole thing. I do voices, right? Voices, yes. Do you remember the first time that you stepped in front of a mic and you go, I'm ready. I, can, I do voices. Let's do this. Let's do this. And then you're in front of the mic and suddenly you're half as good as you're expecting to be. <laughs> yeah. You're like, you're like, wait, but in my shower, this sounded so good. And why can't I 
Yeah. Why can't I command it here while I'm in front of the mic? Why, why am I sucking? Why am I so <laughs> self-conscious? Why am I nervous? Why am I this? Yeah. And you start realizing, it's something that I realized on camera years ago, that you're like, no matter how good you are in private, the moment someone puts a camera or a microphone in your face, totally changes. You're not as good. <laughs> you're not as good yeah. as you think you are because suddenly you have to, you have to perform when they say, and now, yeah, go, yeah. do it. And do it, do it. You're not doing it. Why are you not Why doing you it? Not do Get the next guy yeah. in here. Yeah. And that's, and, and so, you know, Ben Diskin, the reason I liked him so much is that he comes in and just, I mean, he's in a vacuum. Like he, it's like he's, he just walks in and then just does morally. And it's so weird and interesting. And I'm like, that's hard to do. It is. Take a small character like that and make it so memorable and weird and interesting and, and, yeah. and, and so specific. We had a great time talking about it. He was our, our last uh, guest. Well, yeah, it was I episode saw him. three. I saw that. And he did uh, uh, a great scene from Lord of the Rings because I always thought of him as a bit of a, a golem kind yeah. of to it. But he was thinking James Hong. <laughs> so <laughs> Truly he was James Hong. And he had that. Yeah. And the little crap. <laughs> Whenever it counts, things are a lot harder to do, a lot harder to perform. Everything is harder when it counts. Man, I'll tell you how many times I am in the car working out a voice, working out a character, especially, you know, I do a lot of voice matching, so uh -huh. it's like that. And then you get into the room with the director it's whose ears are whatever, and you, and you see it on their faces or through the glass, and all of that comes into play too, and you go, oh, I didn't have that when I was, like you say, in the shower or driving here. Right, well, you just, like, it either just isn't there for you, even though you've practiced the hell out of it, and it just doesn't show up on the day, or, or you're doing something, and the director asks you for something that you hadn't thought of. Yeah, and, oh, and all of a sudden you're off. <laughs> or there's also just this one thing of that maybe it wasn't as good as you actually thought it was. That's true. <laughs> because when you're by yourself, that there, there's a... Oh my goodness, the amount of time I agonized over the voice of Obi-Wan Kenobi because the, the power of these characters mm -hmm. and, and the pressure of that and getting it right and paying proper tribute and, and respect to them. And, you know... Dude, well, these Star Wars rules, as you know they come with a price tag and the price tag <laughs> is if you if you do something that the fans don't like You'll they're going to hold you personally responsible that was the beauty of clone wars though again wasn't it was that <laughs> we got away with it we got away with it and everybody saw what george what his vision was yeah and whether or not they know it was george lucas it was george lucas it was his vision yeah. and i think that's the most important thing for people to to see that yeah um, dave was always making sure we were keenly aware yeah that this was all about George's vision of what was happening at this time in the galaxy. And yeah. also, some people don't know, the Clone Wars was set up for the live action series that he was yeah. writing over there. Yeah. And, you know. And it didn't, didn't happen. Yeah, which I'm grateful. You know what I mean? So, because my whole thing with Clone Wars started for the micro series of the Clone Wars, oh, which yes. was before that. I, I enjoyed and, the hell out of that. Yeah, wasn't that great? It was mm -hmm. so fun and so stylish and that, so different. That's so different. A different set of challenges, the micro series, yeah. but but what the the challenge that the Clone Wars proper had, uh, that the Clone Wars micro series didn't, yeah, is that the micro series because you're only doing these little bites, yeah. Every moment you could do the big destiny moment with the yeah, da, 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 or da, da, the classic da, da, Star Wars lines and or delivery could, or what have you. Because yeah. you were just you were picking moments, yeah. But That's then when you stretch that out and you tell like the sort of day in day out of these yeah. characters. Not every moment can be a destiny moment. Not every moment can be this big, significant moment. Absolutely. Then you actually have to do this build up to the significant moments. Yeah, and that's yeah. where the true call of like what you say of like Story what are you hearing in your head and being able to oh, do it. That's, I mean, that would, yeah. my favorite moments for Obi-Wan are when we see in his life, in his, in his room, you yeah. know, sitting there or goes in to talk to Anakin in his room and then they have these one on one. That's the stuff we see, didn't get quarters. to see in the movies. There wasn't yeah. time for that. Well, which is, we, which by the way, that's the nature of TV series these yeah. days is that these 13 episode orders have replaced the mid level feature film that used yeah. to be in the 80s. Something that someone said about Rogue One, mm -hmm. um, they were like, well, I just didn't quite get, you know, these characters. Mm -hmm. And I said to them, I'm like, do you think? that Han Solo is nearly as iconic if you'd only seen the first film. And they were like, whoa, I'm like, because you're actually getting more character stuff from this character and that character than you are from Han Solo in the original. Now, for the record, yeah, 
Han Solo in the original is the perfect amount of Han Solo in right. that film. But once you play Han Solo out over three movies, yes. and then you live with those movies for 30, 40 years. And books and comics and, and books other things and are comics, put, and put into our heads. That character yeah. is so well fleshed out yeah. that Bays and Chirrut are only going to pale in comparison. The other part, and the thing that I said to them is, I'm like, you're not going to get to know Bays and Chirrut like you get to know Walter White. No, you can't. In, in <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't have the time. And that's no. what we are now comparing against. Well, that movie had no character. Be like, no, no, no. That movie had an appropriate amount of character. You're used to lavish amounts of character. Now, wow, Clone Wars for for allowed yeah. us to lavish more attention on the characters. Right. And like you said, you see Anakin's bedroom and in, you know, his apartment in the Jedi yeah. Temple. Yeah. It has no place in a movie. No. Doesn't really, unless you're doing a different type of movie. Yeah. You know, it's, I, ain't it cool news was very disparaging of the Clone Wars when it first came out. Yeah. Those same guys who disparaged it wrote wonderful, beautiful, eloquent essays on how brilliant the Clone Wars was by the time it ended. <laughs> yeah. So they had by the completely time we won our flipped. Emmys, right? <laughs> but, but one of the things that they said, which I thought was, was damn right, was they were like, it, the Clone Wars makes you realize that the story that George was telling in the prequels was an extraordinary story that was way too big for three movies. Yeah. That's and a great you, point. I hadn't heard that. Uh, oh, quote. yeah. Yeah, it, that's it, a this, great point. I can't remember who exactly. I don't know if it was Quint or Harry Knowles. Good but, for, but good someone for wrote that they're like, it makes you understand, you know, that there wasn't, he didn't just arbitrarily throw stuff up on the screen. This all made sense in his mind, and he was right. trying to relate this story. But if something didn't make sense in the movies, the moment you watch Clone Wars and then revisit the prequels, you go, oh, I know Yes. who the separatists are. And I know how the Trade Federation figures into this and how, yeah. it's, it's how that all works stuff. together. It's... I think it's, it's really uh, wonderful. And it also was the one thing that kept Star Wars alive and introduced Star Wars to so many new fans mm -hmm. and, and families coming together and getting that little fortune cookie in the opening and, and yeah. learning not just about Star Wars, but about life and lessons. And I mean, you know, all they of got that a, stuff. They that... got a 25, 20, what is it, 22 minutes? 22 minutes. They got a 22 minute Star Wars movie every week. Yeah, and they were movies and that was the thing. And we were all very aware of that and saying that all the time to people. It's like, you do realize these are, this isn't just like a TV show and this yeah. isn't just a cartoon. Yeah, well, what was really like one of the best moves they made was uh, doing the four episode arcs or the three episode arcs to Absolutely. where you actually were now getting a feature yeah. length Clone Wars movie over the course of four weeks. But right. when you watch it at home, you watch it all together and you're getting yeah. you a get, movie. Yeah, you're getting the whole thing. I remember going to the Egyptian and seeing the, uh, the arc with the brothers and- uh, Oh my God, we saw that at the Egyptian, didn't yeah. we? Yeah, yeah, you remember that? Wasn't that fun? How could I have- <laughs> In Clancy. I almost forgot, because what's funny is when I see you, mm -hmm. I have very strong memories of lining up. This is my memory. <laughs> Clone Wars cast was there. Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. And I lined up with you guys. And the way you guys were treating me and the way that, that everyone else was treating me, I felt like I was part of the cast. Oh, and, and, well, and, I, and I guess I am. Part of the family, you know, yeah. But, but, but you guys really did a great job of making me feel that way. Like, I felt like oh, after a great. while, I felt like Clone Wars... That's, oh yeah, that's, that's my show. Yeah, oh, absolutely. As much as, you know. I mean, again, that's which is why weird. it's like, we, we can sit here and this is a two-part episode because it's, it's like, yeah, you go, you look and you go nine episodes out of, you know, 129 episodes. It feels as though you were there every single time and you were such a strong, I'll use the word, force. Uh, and we had so much fun when you were there. It, it, I was ble I'm, I'm blessed to know you as, as a person, but I'm blessed to have worked with you in that capacity. Well, the, you and Matt Lanter and Ashley couldn't have been nicer to me oh, or more cool. welcoming. And, and uh, it's good. you know, there's something about Star Wars fans, and that's not to say that a fan of anything can't be a jerk, <laughs> but Star Wars is principally uh, a story that's yeah. about don't be a jerk. Yeah. It's about... Be nice to people, right? And yeah. and I've found that Star Wars fans, there is a higher occurrence of people that buy into that philosophy in their lives. That Absolutely. Are a nicer than I, your average person. I've said person. that for 16 years now. They're yeah. the best fans in the world. I mean, and I've been very fortunate to work in some great franchises, but Star Wars fans, when they come up to you, you can tell yeah. when you're at a con, 
who's the Star Wars fan, not just by the T-shirt yeah. they're wearing. There, was, there is this kind of kindness. Mm -hmm. uh, there is. Seeking. Mm -hmm. They're seeking what Luke was seeking. You and, know what I mean? And, and it's, it's so nice that the Clone Wars as a cast had people that understood that this was a special thing and that, yeah. and that they treated everyone like this was, this was a good group. This is, you know what I mean? Tracy like Canobio puts it very well oh, when we talk. Tracy. And Tracy, of course, uh, from Lucasfilm and the publicity there, and she does such a wonderful job with all of it, and she's balanced so much through so many years of believing in this. Yes. She was one of the first firm believers of the cast of Clone Wars as mm -hmm. this family doing something in an outreach differently than any show had ever done or anything yeah. that they'd ever been involved with. And it, it just happened naturally. Why? Because all of us are Star Wars fans. Yes. We weren't doing it to like, yeah, isn't this going to be cool? It was like, no, isn't this cool? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, that's always kind of the balance with it all. And that's why I've, I've always been so humbled to work in it mm -hmm. and so grateful to have any opportunity in it because it is the neatest thing to do is to the coolest. I mean, coolest. I, I was going to say coolest job, but that's not the way we thought of it. It's no, the it coolest thing you could be doing with your time. Yeah, it was just a part of, of life. Yeah. And it was for so many years. And Star Wars Weekends, and you came out, hung out with us at Star Wars Weekends. So we had fun. a great time. And, uh, I Which, by the way, at the time, when, when they say, come out for Star Wars Weekends, I didn't know what that was. Yeah. I, I remember it like hit you like midway through. It hit me like, midway through that this, this is really awesome. When we were on that <laughs> stage outside with 15,000 people out there. And you go, ladies and gentlemen, Sam Witwer. And I remember you had like this big grin on your face. And after we got off stage, you're like, what this is heck? so cool. Yeah, well, there's that. But also the thing that I, look, I've, I've been very fortunate to um, go to Disney parks and stuff on sure. vacations yeah, when yeah. I was a kid. Yeah. So I was always into this. And I always thought it was, was a cool thing. Um, but I'm going to admit to something. Um, <laughs> When it came, because when, when for Star Wars weekends, um, you know they want you to do like stage shows and stuff yeah. like that, and and they'll hand you this script that is so antiseptic and <laughs> yeah. family friendly to the point where you want to vomit on the pages. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, oh my god, what have I gotten myself into? I have to be on stage and do this. And then you arrive there and you meet the people that are working on it, and yeah. then you're there, yeah. and they go, so this is just the thing that we have to yeah. get to you and get signed <laughs> off on. Let's let's now come up with some stuff that might be really kind of fun and funny, <laughs> right. and and you start realizing that the everyone that you're working with are really clever, smart people, to the point where I never would have thought because I was going to that Star Wars weekends thing, thinking the stage show for the families and stuff like that was just going to be this very lame thing, and it Smiling ended up waves. being yeah. so fun, oh, good. <laughs> so funny, and or well, like you were such a sport because I remember you had a pretty bad cold. Oh, that's like right. Did, that's yeah, right. I, like, I did. I did. Uh, yeah. we, we felt so bad because, and you were just like trudging through it and doing I th great. I thought it was so. You and Ashley made that so much fun. She was. We were. Yeah. We I never thought fun. that doing sort of a family friendly, because <laughs> I've done some very uh, edgy and yeah, you know, not always family friendly stuff. Star Wars is certainly very family friendly. Absolutely. But um, but I was, I was just. I remember just thinking, this is. Ridiculous. This this shouldn't be so much fun. This it's is so much still fun. a pretty viral video where uh, because you remember my buddy Tom, Tom Wilson. Wilson came out. Oh, dude, that's a moment in my <laughs> life. The fact that I got to be menaced by Biff Ten, dude. <laughs> Just to, to review, yeah, yeah, he was in the audience. Yeah, he he was doing some stand up in town, and I oh, and and he and I are very dear friends. And I was like, Tom, would you mind coming out and doing a little cameo? Because he has worked in Star Wars a little here and there, mm. and so. Yeah, he comes up and... He was in the audience, and as I recall, we say something, and then he came up on stage and joined us, Yeah, and I was I was being Darth Maul, I was being very mean to you and, and yeah, sort yeah. of and trying to bully you, and then he, come, he comes up behind me and pulls some Biff Tannen and on you me. And pulled I'm, out a little... Uh... Oh, hey, oh, Biff. Hey, Biff. <laughs> hey, guys. How's it going? Yeah. I'm just not good at confrontation. Yeah. Uh, such great stuff uh, and so much fun. And we had a great moment, though, where we were, I don't know if you remember this, the whole stage um, is very technologically advanced. And yes, they've got these is, screens yeah. and the playback and all this, and it all went out. And we were That's about to show a right. clip. That's how we end the show. That's so right. It's behind the force. We take you behind the force and show you how we do Clone Wars and all this. And we end the show showing a clip, and all of it was out. And it was a new <laughs> clip that nobody you know, had seen yet. But so we go... Okay, we'll recreate it for you. That's, oh, I forgot. So, oh so God. Tom was 
uh, I don't know if he was Anakin or something. Ashley played right. Ahsoka, I think. I played uh, Yoda, and and you played Mace, and you came out, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> and people lost their minds. It was so much we fun. We had no choice. We had no choice. We had no choice. Tom had picked to me up and carried me across the stage. It was just... That was funny. And you were just... You didn't miss a beat. You know, some of the stuff that they have going on in those parks are... I mean, they have extraordinarily talented and smart individuals doing they do. weird and cool things. Yeah, yeah. And they did that for so long. Star Wars Weekends, I, I was lucky enough to host for five years out of the many years they did it. And what an adventure. What a fun time. Yeah. Uh, once in a lifetime stuff and yeah. you know it'd be fun if they do it again I, but well it's funny i actually asked i'm like so so uh i asked someone so what so what what happened to star wars weekends and they said every weekend is going to be star wars weekends coming up yeah we, we they're That's like the, we can't really because they're like we're about to he's like trust me we got a lot of Star Wars. and i as much <laughs> as i agree with that the other thing i would say the wonderful thing about star wars weekends was it allowed fans to interact with the Sam Witwers, the Matt Lanters, the Ashley Ecksteins, right. the, all the, this, the it, cast a special and thing. crew, and then the people from the films, Ray Park, Jeremy yeah. Bullock, Warwick Davis, uh, Frank Oz, we had Frank out there, yep. and um, Mark Hamill, Mark came out, and you know, so that was the cool thing. So I hope they do something like that again at some point, once it's all built and done. It probably, I would, I would, I would imagine. imagine they'd have to. Well, there's so much more there, so much more to come in this two-part conversation with Sam Whitler. Next episode, we'll dive even deeper into his acting in Star Wars, as well as his very busy on-camera career. Plus, we'll get back behind the microphones as our two famous Clone Wars characters, with a reading that is unexpected, unbound, and unforgettable to all that want more Maul and Obi-Wan. Please subscribe to the JAT channel if you have not already, and make sure you check out all the content here, including my Day in the Life vlogs, special features like JAT 365, Tell Titus a Tale, The JAT Show, and of course, past episodes of Clone Wars Conversations. Special thanks to Mountain Valley Water, the official water of the JAT channel. I'm James Arnold Taylor. Thanks for joining me for this conversation.